In most languages, there are words that sound the same but are spelled differently. These are called homophones. For example, in English, bread and bread are homophones. If you wrote, I toasted some bread, then native English speakers would say that you spelled the word wrong. It's not that bread is an objectively incorrect spelling, but rather the correct spelling depends on the meaning and context of the word. In the same way, musical notes may sound the same, but can be spelled in different ways. If you showed me the following chord, I would say that the middle note is spelled wrong. It should be an A flat instead of a G sharp. G sharp and A flat are enharmonically equivalent. In other words, they sound the same, but they're spelled differently. They're kind of like musical homophones. For the music nerds watching my channel, I realize that I'm assuming equal temperament, just intonation, and microtonal music are a topic for another day. Misspellings like this can make music quite difficult to read for musicians. They let the person reading your score know that you're an amateur, and they're one of the most common mistakes I see in beginner's scores. Often this is the result of playing notes into a notation program using a MIDI keyboard. Your notation program doesn't know which spelling you intend, so how can you tell? Well, just like in English, the correct spelling depends on the meaning and context of the note. Let's talk about a few different scenarios. If you have a simple major or minor chord, then all the notes should be spaced two apart. For example, an F minor chord always has an F, an A flat, and a C, not a G sharp. Even if this is in three separate staves, it shouldn't be a G sharp, it should be an A flat. If you're a pianist or a conductor, for example, you can very quickly read triads in any inversion almost without thinking. But trying to read this odd chord on the right requires you to stop and work it out, which wastes precious rehearsal or practice time. Music should be as easy to read as possible, even if it takes more time to write. Why? Because it will be written once, but read, hopefully, many times by many different people. What about moving from chord to chord? Let's say we're in D flat major, a common key for pianists, for example. If you play the following chords into your notation program using a MIDI keyboard, it will probably be notated like this. This is really confusing. Why would we suddenly have an F sharp minor chord in D flat major? That's hard to read because of all the accidentals. The problem is that it's not really an F sharp minor chord, it's a G flat minor chord, which is simply the minor four in D flat. And the chord after that, similarly, is not a B minor chord, but a C flat minor chord, which, yes, has an E double flat in it, but it is correct. It's a flat seven chord in D flat major. You can see that this is much easier to read than the original and captures the voice leading admirably. We'll talk more about voice leading in a minute. Now, if you're going around the circle of fifths, eventually you'll have to change key enharmonically somewhere, unless you want to end up in B double flat minor. This would obviously be much easier to read if it were A minor. So where do you make that enharmonic switch? Ideally, somewhere before you get too many double flats or double sharps, and when you're not making huge leaps in any of the voices. So, we could make the switch on the G flat minor chord to avoid any double flats at all. Sometimes you can tie one note enharmonically to another note, or sometimes composers will put a little enharmonic note in parentheses like this, particularly in choral music. Once the singer has read it once and figured out what's going on, this makes the next note much easier to hit than, say, jumping from a D flat to an F sharp, which is difficult to read and most singers won't realize is actually a perfect fourth. Frequently, you'll have a melody that has non-chord tones in it. If they're all in the same key, you just use the notes in that key. In this example, all the passing and neighbor notes are in F minor, so all the notes are notated that way. 
But it's also very common to find chromatic passing notes and neighbor notes that aren't part of the home key. So how do you determine how to notate those? Well, first, you'll need to understand the function of each of your notes. Let's take the following example. The first G sharp is a chromatic neighbor note between the two surrounding A's. It's a leading tone to A, thus G sharp, not A flat. The C sharp is a neighbor note between the two D's, therefore C sharp, not D flat. And that informs the accompaniment chord. It's an F augmented chord which has a C sharp in it, not a D flat augmented chord. But there's a D flat on the way down, not a C sharp. That's because it's a chord tone in this G half diminished 7 chord. The same note can be spelled differently in different contexts. This example starts with the same two notes as the last one, but in this case the G sharp is spelled as an A flat. Why? Because it's not a neighbor note or a leading tone to anything. Rather, we're changing chord from F major to F minor. Since the second chord is F minor, it contains an A flat, not a G sharp. Similarly, in the second bar, we're changing from a B double flat major chord to a D flat minor chord. So the notes are B double flat, and A flat. What about chromatic passages with no clear function? In this case, the general guidance is to sharpen the note going up and flatten the note going down. But in fast passages like this, It's clear just to keep the C sharp going down instead of D flat to avoid an excess number of accidentals to be read quickly. And what about chromatic scales? Here just choose a spelling for each note that minimizes accidentals and stick with it while you're in that key. Use the same spelling going up and going down. You may have also noticed that there are quite a few chromatic notes in the left hand. How can we tell how to spell them? By realizing that they're just arpeggiated chords. Once we spell the chords according to the rules we've already outlined, we can break them up into arpeggios. Oh, and on a chromatic run, don't have three or more of the same note consecutively with different accidentals, D flat, D, and D sharp, for example. That's really hard to read. Either make the D flat a C sharp, or make the D sharp an E flat. Just like all good rules, there are a few exceptions. First, writing for harp. Harps have seven pedals. Each pedal adjusts all of the strings that play one of the seven notes of the scale. So, in pieces that aren't fully diatonic, they will sometimes have to play an F minor chord, for example, with a sharpened G string instead of a flattened A string, so that they can quickly play an A natural afterwards. So, should you notate a G sharp or an A flat? The answer is, it depends. Some harpists prefer to see the actual notes that they should play, but other harpists prefer to see the enharmonically equivalent note if it's in a triad. In this example from Britain's Ceremony of Carols, the harpist is playing an A major chord in the left hand, but a D flat and C in the right hand. So the C sharp in the left hand would have to be played with a D flat, but Britain notates it as a C sharp anyway because it's easier to read. So in this case, the harpist can clearly see the harmonies, but it's harder to determine which strings to play. If Britain had notated it like this instead, it would be easy to see the strings to play, but harder to read the harmonies. In general, I would say that if the passage is clearly in some key, it's best to use the correct spellings, but otherwise, notate the strings that are played. And regardless, it's always nice to put in some pedal markings, even if the harpist changes them, just to show that you've actually thought about it. Another exception is transposing instruments. Let's say your piece is in B major and it contains an E flat clarinet. Well, B major, when transposed down a minor third for E flat clarinets, would be 
G sharp major, which has an F double sharp in it. You can't have a key signature with an F double sharp in it, so this would be notated as A flat major in the E flat clarinet part. Finally, serial music is usually written using 12-tone rows. Each note in that 12-tone row has a specific spelling that should be used consistently, even if it forms a triad and that triad is spelled wrong. Also, serial music is notated without a key signature, and often there is an accidental before every note. That's because the whole point of serialism is to get away from tonality, so any triadic relationships are necessarily fleeting, unless you're talking about the music of Aubin Berg, who often chose 12-tone rows with deliberate tonal underpinnings, but that's a topic for another video. Finally, let's look at a couple of examples combining voice leading and triads. Can you figure out how the missing chord should be notated? In this example, you could think of the missing chord as a sort of neighbor chord. Technically, it's a prolongation of the D-flat major tonic chord, but what is it, and how do we notate it? Well, let's consider the motion of some of the notes in the chord. We want the G in there, because the motion from F to A-flat has to have a G in the middle. And we want the A-flat, B-double-flat, A-flat in the bottom note of a chord. So, this is a German sixth chord, notated like this. If this chord were spread across multiple voices, we might notate the F flat as an E natural instead to make the F E F motion clear. What about this example? This starts with the same two chords, but in this case, the missing chord is clearly the dominance of D major, so it should be notated as an A7 chord. I tried a new format for this video, shorter and to the point, with lots of examples. If you liked it, please hit the like button to help others find it. If you enjoy this type of content, then be sure to subscribe to my channel so you get notified when my next video comes out. And if you have any feedback, please leave a comment. I do read them all, and I reply to as many as I can. So until next time, have a good one.